Well, hello everyone and very welcome to this session of the PCST network. Uh, it's called uh, Education and Science Shows today, Education and Science Shows. There will be a wide range of talks, but somehow connecting and covering that topic. Uh, my name is Jan Riese. I'm not in Aberdeen either. I'm in Sweden and uh, where I work at the Chalmers University of Technology with sustainability issues. Uh, we have a very nice team of 10 speakers, still missing one, I'm afraid. And um, uh, we will just go on in a minute. I think we'll give late attendees one more minute to, to check in and um, get online here, where we're going to have these at least nine presentation, hopefully also 10 presentations. There are some very simple house rules. Uh, the speakers all have got three minutes to present, to present, and um, then I'll cut off the sound or something. Uh, but um, I hope that everyone will um, stick to this, and uh, I'm sure they will. Uh, and then we'll have like 15 or 20 minutes at the end for questions. So please, all attendees who wants to ask questions, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Uh, I will certainly look in the Q&A, but I'll try to keep track of the chat as well. Uh, if you're on Twitter or Facebook or other social media, please add the hashtag PCST2021, and then we'll find it all in the, in the same. Uh, uh, in the same flow of, of um, entries to Twitter and Facebook. Uh, um, that's about it. There will be a poll at the end where all that and these are asked to uh, to uh, vote for the most or the, what you think is the best presentation tonight. All the this is the ninth session, I think, um, and there is at least one. There is one more. So um, at the end, all these presenters, the best presenters of each session will be invited to do a, a set, uh, an extra presentation at some point during the... Um... So I think we should get started now. Uh, we'll first go to um, Spain and Girona and someone who's called Mikel Duran, but it is not Mikel Duran. It's Silvia Simon, who is uh, taking the place of Mikkel, and will talk about um, uh, science communication in non-science events, which I think is a very good thing. We've talked about it for many times and many years, but I think you have some very nice experience from Spain here, so let's hear it. You have your three minutes, and I will <laughs> start this uh, timer right now. Please, Silvia. Okay, so good afternoon. Thank you very much as uh thank you jan as you said i am not in aberdeen i am in girona in girona this is this is a team from university of girona and universitat politecnica de madrid so we are at the moment uh, we are involved in science communication from the cathedra of science communication and, and digital communication so we have been, we have spent maybe 10, 10 years just trying to explain to the people which are the universities uh, or, or in which kind of research are universities working. So it comes from the, the, the fact that we are computational chemists, I am a researcher, so I always need to have, uh, uh, I, was, I always had many problems trying to explain what I was uh, researching. So, okay, we are start with this uh, idea of showing to the non-science people what is the research, the science research, chemi chemistry research and math research at the university. So, I remember that once a colleague of mine told me if if society does not come at the university to learn about science, just do the other way around. Just put the science and the research on the street near the society. 
So this is why we decide just to start with different ideas related to bringing to the society where the society is the science. So some examples uh, are for, uh, in Girona, we have a very nice uh, flower festival. Now this week we have this flower festival. So um, in the last edition, not last year for sure, but two years ago, um, almost one, uh, no, uh, half a million people just visit Girona to, to visit the flowers. So we just decide to build a periodic table three years ago to build a Rubik cube just to show something about programming and everything and to put there in the festival. So it is a way of bringing, just put there where the society is, just uh, put our research. And we are using for this uh, magic. So we magic is a tool that uh, makes people feel uh, that science it's something magic, but not. So in that way, we have different uh, walks around Girona showing science, but using cars, for example, using uh, magic. And, and these are two different examples. We have many other examples that we try to, put, to, to bring the research to the people, but, but where the people is. That means fair festivals and markets. Sylvia, I'm afraid I'll have to, but maybe that was the end of the yeah. presentation. Yeah, it Wonderful. was the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I guess that, or I guess I can say to everyone who's listening or watching this, that if you want to know more about this, please put your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, well, in my, on my screen, it's at the bottom. I don't know. Maybe there are different things. Anyway, thanks for this. Now we'll move over to uh, Nemesio uh, Herrera Espinosa in Peru. And yes, you have a presentation. Yes, you. far away from us and not in Aberdeen. No one is in Aberdeen. Sent you. Sent you. So please, I see you have a presentation about scientific research in the context of epistemology. So please, you have, uh, like everyone else, the three minutes and the screen is yours. You're welcome to present. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Excuse me for uh, my English. Peru, my country, accepts. Peru is a rich country in the terms of natural resources and biodiversity, but it is a very poor country. Most importantly, there isn't science. Why? Because the Peruvian university do not carry out scientific research in the light of epistemology. Therefore, there isn't public communication of science. Considering that in the present times, it is impossible to promote the development of societies without science and technology, this paper focuses on raising two binding policies for the university. Policy one, scientific research whose main objective is the production of science and technology is a priority activity and must be carried in rigorously in the light of epistemology. The Peruvian university is highly professionalizing and unscientific attention. The Peruvian university is unscientific. Police two, the public communication of science must be a compulsory transversal activity. Number three, 
necessary observation. Epistemology understood as a framework of scientific research. Epistemology isn't philosophy of science. Epistemology is the study of science because between science and philosophy, there is a difference. Attention, the following is very important. For the above considerations, it is necessary to seek new practices in terms of scientific research and public communication of science. In the framework of a necessary university restructuring process, the Peruvian university must claim their main mission to be the production of science and technology through scientific research in the context epistemology. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for a very interesting presentation of your country. I see that you have uh, many challenges and I really hope that you have a lot of friends who can help you, not least in this community. Uh, anyway, thanks a lot. Uh, let's move, let's stay in um, Latin America and go to Brazil and La Laertio Ferracoli, Ferracioli, who will um, talk about science communication on the centenary of the solar eclipse in Subral. Uh, an amazing and, uh, well, I'm very curious to hear about this. Please, uh, Laertio, go on and I will have to ask. Yes, that's fine. The screen is yours uh, for three minutes and um, well, here you go. And it may be that you're muted. I'm sorry, but we can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, here again. There you are. Thank Hi, you. everyone. Thanks for very much for joining us in this presentation. I'm going to report here uh, a work that we've done in a high school in Vila Velha, Brazil, state of Spirit Santo. Uh, the whole idea is just uh, that we have the sort of uh, uh, discipline out of the curriculum just to promote the engagement of students in science. So what I'm going to talk about is these three aspects here. And the major idea is this one here. Uh, science communication is a tool for engaging students in science and promoting them the public understanding of science in general. In this case here, it's about Einstein ideas historical um, the relevant, relevance of sobral ellipses, eclipses in 1919 in Brazil, the articulation the theoretical and empirical work from Einstein. And uh, what moved us was the, the words of Bertrand Russell, that Einstein ideas will be easy to future generation who will grow up with them, like the, the curved space-time, uh, environment that we have in the universe. So that's the main idea. So here we have the, the, the general ideas about the, the eclipse solar, the solar eclipse in, in Sobral, north, northeast of Brazil. Um, the ideas I'm not going to explain here because it is, um, we have a quite short short of time. And uh, some photos at that moment in 29th of May in 1919. And uh, there were two points in the world that this eclipse could be seen in Africa and in Brazil. And the, the photo that we take in Brazil that, that proves the ideas, I think ideas about the general relativity. Um, so here is this, this discipline in the school, this high school. It took a semester and it was a two hour uh, discipline a week. And the students were highly engaged that we, we talked about the theoretical aspects of Einstein ideas and the practical ones. So they were engaged in doing preparation. They prepared some experiments to show <clears throat> the, in the end of the, the discipline to the whole school. And who, here we can see in their light deflection that the, the simulator with a cardboard highlight pen and a black, bed, black, black light bulb 
just to simulate what was the solar eclipse. Here we can see the students, they, they, they built a kind of timeline uh, that you can see the whole, all, the whole group of students here. Uh, this work was developed by Professor uh, the Thiago Pereira, who is here. He's a physics teacher in this school. He was the main mentor of this discipline. And then we worked together. So, so here we can see how the whole students working together. Um, the space type curvature simulator that they built here. Uh, there was a theater. And it was interesting because this, this the figure of Einstein here was built a semester later by a student who, that, who didn't take the, 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 the discipline. And they built this very nice poster, Einstein post in the school. So uh, we applied a kind of, uh, we asked them to write down five words and they we, we produced this kind of uh, cloud words, which came so, up uh, with this to, uh, to finish now, let's see. Yes, and the finalize that we have science communication that promotes a culture of science where any citizens and citizen makes transformative decisions uh, based on minimal evidence, objective, rational, and realistic by your life and the whole society that they live in. So that is, that's my presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. What a uh, uh, nice way of ending it with this uh, enthusiastic and stimulating words. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and again, please put your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the, of the screen. If you have, um, we'll go to uh, uh, Miguel Ferreira now with, I think, a video. Yes. Yeah, you may I have uh, some slides and then the, the video. OK. OK. You have your three minutes as everyone else. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's all <laughs> it's all under the, the time. <laughs> okay, just a moment. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Miguel Ferreira. I am a science communicator and a researcher in University of Coimbra, Portugal. And I'm here today to present you the initiative PubHD Coimbra. The first PubHD took place in Nottingham in 2014 with the premise that once a month, three PhD students from any academic discipline will be challenged to present their work in 10 minutes to an audience in a pub using only a whiteboard to explain their ideas. A year later, it arrived in Lisbon and quickly expanded to other cities in Portugal. And Coimbra was no, was no exception. And in 2017, in the midst of our um, science SciComm conference, the first edition took place. In order to present you past achievements and to talk about future challenges, we have produced a short video that I will now show to you. I hope you are listening the the music. Not really. No. Can I uh, start again because uh, I forget please. to Please do. Okay, sorry. Because when I I start the share, I didn't put the option to share my sound. Right. So sorry. Okay, I think there is an option here. Okay. Okay, here we go. Sorry, once again.
Thank you so much for your attention. I would be, be glad to discuss with you some questions and to to answer your doubts. Thank you once again, and sorry for the for the mistake. No problem, of the song. Either, no problem. Thanks a lot for this, and I, and I also like this uh, mm -hmm. informal, relaxed, and and uh, all the other words you had there. It's, it seems like people actually enjoy this very much. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> they do. <laughs> Now let's go to uh, more magic. Luis um, have something called magic with mats. Yes, well, thank you. Yes, well, you're prepared and you can go on and the screen is yours and well, please go on for like three minutes from now. Yes, I'm looking for the option to share my audio too. <laughs> well, I we'll have to ask Miguel because about that. <laughs> it's before before you choose what you want to to share you have um, a little box sharing my the sound of my computer now choose share screen okay, okay. oh yeah sure thank you yeah okay excellent thanks <laughs> no worries. great so you can see my screen right now right Right. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, in this video, I show you a sample of a workshop we developed in the outreach team Matemorphosis at the Mathematic Mathematical Research Center in Guanajuato, Mexico. So let's go. Hi, this is Steve. I'm Luis, and this is Magic with Maths. This might not be a very standard presentation. I want to present something practical and something to have fun with. So I show you an amazing magic trick. For this trick, we are gonna need a shuffle poker deck and the help of Monse. Hi. Please tell me a number between ten and twenty. Mm -hmm. Thirteen. Okay, I'll go down that number. Can you put your hands like this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen cards. In order to randomize this selection a bit more, I'll count the result of the sum of the two digits of the number. In this case, it will be the one plus three, four. So I'll count down one, two, three, and the fourth card is your card. You're gonna wanna look at it, and I'm gonna place it right in the middle of the deck. Please end the deck. Thank you. And the deck is gonna be inside of my poker, inside of my pocket. Now, the trick is about grabbing the card from wherever it is. Let's see. Okay, I have one. Is your card the two of clubs? No. No? Well, I don't know what happened. Um, help me here. Is it a club? Yes. Okay, we are on the right track. Mm, let me see. I have another one. This is the six of clubs. No. No? Well, this one was bigger. Is it even bigger? Yeah. Okay, you can try that. Yes, I have the eight of clubs. No. No? It, it, that was bigger. Is it even bigger? Yeah. Okay, is it this big? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is an amazing and entertaining trick that requires only simple arithmetics. The key part is placing the card that we want to be picked in the tenth position from the top. Let's say they call the number 12. Well, we count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. No, it doesn't matter the number they choose. Uh, we will always subtract from these cards the number in the units, in this case 2, plus 1, the number in the tens. So we'll always get back to the card, the magician. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I cut it right there. Uh, this is a small part of the uh, Magic with Maths uh, workshops. Of course, uh, the final goal of this material is to lead the students to understand a specific topic and a specific subject. As a final comment, uh, the workshops don't go exactly like that. Uh, we do present the trick as a magic act, almost the same. And, but then we motivate the students to analyze it and get to what is the tool. And finally, together we get to that mathematical tool we want to explore with them. And that will be all. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Luis. That is uh, amazing. Uh, I'm a little bit sad that you cut the video just when we were going to have the final explanation there, but um, maybe we'll have to figure it out how you did it. 
<laughs> maybe it's in the paper. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but thank you so much for this. And maybe we can come back to that in the question session. Then. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. No problem. No problem at all. You're all very welcome. And um, for those who are, we have a few new attendees. I should say that if you have some questions, put them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And uh, if you are on Twitter, please use the hashtag TCSD2021. Now we'll go to uh, Kenya and Noni Mumba from the Kemri Welcome Organization in Kenya. And I believe you are with us now, aren't you? Yes, I'm very sorry uh, for uh, coming in late. Yes. Welcome. So let Good me share. You. Yeah, thank you. And hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, play a video uh, that shows our um, public engagement uh, initiatives using drama or uh, magnet theater. So um, I hope this is going to work. Um, Somebody let me know through nodding or something if they can see that and I'll start playing. I hope the sound is okay. Sound is okay? Oh, how about that? Maybe you should stop it and go back to the advice that Miguel had on how to okay. share. Oh. Yeah, yeah. See again, Miguel. Yeah, you, you have to stop the sharing and when okay. you okay. stop the sharing. Uh huh. And now when you push the, the button to share your screen, there's a little mm -hmm. option uh, below. Uh, share that, sound. Uh, share sound, share exactly. Sounds. Yeah. 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 Thanks again. And <laughs> here we now, are. This will be fine. We are basically a theater company. We use theater to communicate. <laughs> so Magnet Theater is it's theater for development. So it's, it's informal theater, so to speak. So it's done with no specific stage. It can be done under a tree like you're doing it. The, the skit is normally about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we freeze. We stop it at a dilemma. The Magnet Theatre is guided by a facilitator. The facilitator comes in and now guides the process where we invite the audience. You have watched the skit, you have seen it stopped at this point. What was the cause? What, what caused that? How can we rectify? And normally, especially at the coast, people love live performances and they, they really relate to this. So they come, people participate readily, they come and give their, their opinions. Nongapi, washa jiusisha na utafiki hapa. Utafiki wote. Nisha wa ikusikia lakini sija fatilia. O auja fatilia. Uluku umesikia tu. Kusale kama leo hui ungefua tu wewe na uambiwe. Uulizo kama unezaingia katika utafiki. O ugonjwa kama ule uneza kubali. Kiviongo mimi naeza kubali. But we also invite, invite a guest speaker to come and just give the facts and the truths of whatever the, the key question is. The beauty of Magnet Theatre is that we interact and the audience also participate. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much. 
Uh, right. Thank you. Happy to take questions later. Yes, and I think we'll need you to come to Europe and do some of this magic in <laughs> here as well. Very nice to see that film. Um, so we'll uh, have the questions later, as said, and uh, we'll jump back to Brazil for a, another three minute presentation from uh, Marcelo. Um, you're going to talk about data scraping to the rescue. And uh, please yes. explain yourself. Um, you have your three minutes as everyone else, and uh, please, the screen is yours. Thank you. Um, just a little, a minute, so I can share my screen. Mm -hmm. um, hope you can see my screen now. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to share my study with such qualified colleagues. The work I'm presenting now was made by me and Professor Roberto Takata. Uh, we both work at the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil. We decided to make a study uh, from the SOMOS database, which organizes and presents data of the university's output. So uh, we chose six universities that use the SOMOS platform. Um, all of them are federal universities as well. We use it web scraping tools in order to extract data from the SOMOS platform. And we resort to web scraping because there are still no public APIs available for science databases in Brazil. Uh, let me show some screens of the SOMOS platform, which I was talking about, so you can know what it's about. Then uh, we collected all the keywords used by scientists who works with science communication at each university. In this way, we created six vectors of words uh, which could be compared. Uh, we made this comparison using two different similarity indexes, the Jacquard index, use it also in biology, and the cosine of similarity. The results obtained by both calculations are similar, uh, as we can see on this slide. In general, what determined the similarity was the size of the vectors, uh, but we can see some nuances. For example, uh, UFMG is more similar to Unicamp than, for, uh, than to UFSCar, although we have collected more keywords from the later. Another analysis we made uh, with this, this data is related to the semantics of the keywords collected. We produced keywords uh, clouds by university. Here are the keyword clouds. Uh, the first conclusion is the prevalence of terms related to, related to education or teacher's training which appears much more than other important areas related to science communication, such as journalism, museums, or public engagement. Another aspect we can observe uh, from these clouds is that the lack of registration of the science outputs can bias the results. For example, the importance uh, here, the importance of the term discourse analysis in the Cefet word cloud might be overestimated once this specific institution is a technological school. So to conclude, I would like to reinforce that this type of analysis can bring important understandings of how uh, you, different universities approaches science communication. This method would benefit from the implementation of public APIs that could allow easier and broader access to science databases. And certainly a limitation that must be taken into account is the lack of correct registration by scientists. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you all a great conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very good. And uh, another interesting question to think about how universities, different universities, universities approach science communication. Maybe we can come back to that later on as well. Uh, we'll. Um, have a presentation about Portuguese students now from Anna. And uh, maybe you would like to present the uh, present this yourself and I leave the screen to you for three minutes. Thank you, Thank you so much. My name is Anna Carvalho and I'm also from Coimbra. So let's start. The majority of us have a stereotype image of a scientist. What about our students? Do they also have one? 
To study that, we decide to ask 60 children between 8 and 11 years old to draw themselves as a scientist. Let's start with a, an example. This is a lab in the sunny day with a scientist with a lab coat and safety equipment. Yes, she's performing two experiments. One, the one that she did, did that did on the lab, and another one that she wished to have done, make a potion to explode. Yes, they have a stereotype image of a scientist. To study that, we use the Ma Marguerite Madden Metro classic stereotype image of the scientist and also the draw scientist test. But for our study, we focus on draw scientist test checklist. To perform our study, we um, take in consideration the Institute of Education and Citizenship that is a non-formal institution in the center of Portugal that have advanced courses in experimental sciences. So we ask our students to draw, I'm a scientist doing an experiment at the lab. And after that, we check their drawings with dust C. I will share with you some results. The majority of them were wearing a lab coat. Moreover, they had and they share with us some, um, some research symbols, knowledge symbols, and also danger and mysticism, mysticism symbols. Moreover, all of them were in close places. We went further and we decided to check other characteristics. We check emotions. The majority were smiling. We also evaluate isolation versus collaboration. The majority was working alone. Only two exceptions were working collaboratively. We also evaluate, are they doing or just observing the experiments? The majority were doing the experiments and not standing by. We also evaluate imagination and other influences like making potions. As my conclusions, this dust C needs to, to have some alterations in our study, moreover, Moreover, the advanced course was not able to deconstruct the stereotype image of the scientist. In fact, it have limitations, is done inside and with low flexibility. About the representations of the stereotype image, we have the influence of the course, but also from the school and the media. As future work, we need to increase our population. We need to test our drawings before and after uh, this course and else we need to promote uh, extra activities to deconstruct the stereotype image of the scientists like involving social scientists and also outdoor activities. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anna. That was excellent. And I like the idea of a <laughs> scientist working alone, but smiling. That's fine. People who like to work for themselves. Uh, I'm afraid they're wrong. I think most publications and other things are done in, in uh, collaboration with others, some of them with hundreds of authors or even thousands. Anyway, that's not our, uh, that's not our topic today. Thanks a lot. And uh, we'll now have a, a, one of the answers to one of the really difficult questions. Um, that's the one about saving the world. So we'll go to uh, Netherlands and Florentine in Utrecht, I think. And you have a presentation called Saving the World, One Psychom Text at a Time. Please, I'm very curious. You have your three minutes from now. Thank you. Let me just share my presentation. Um, All right, so um, hi everyone, my name is Florentine Sterk. I'm a junior assistant professor at Utrecht University. And um, the goal of my research is to develop training in science communication skills, or in other words, popularization for liberal arts and sciences at Utrecht University. Um, it's an undergraduate program that combines liberal education with interdisciplinary training. So liberal education means that each student chooses their uh, own disciplinary major so that could be either in the humanities the social sciences or the natural sciences and then interdisciplinary training means that these students work together in multidisciplinary teams to solve interdisciplinary research problems 
Um, and the first step in setting up this education is to actually perform a baseline assessment. So to um, see which kinds of skills these students already enter the program with so that training can be adapted to their needs. And in order to do so, we asked first year students that had just started their training to write a newspaper article that was based on an academic text that they had read beforehand. And we gathered uh, 140 texts that we then analyzed. And from that, we were able to um, draw up five lessons for our own educational practice. The first is that we need to teach the genre demands of popularization discourse. So we need to teach students what uh, science communication actually looks like because they were able to use uh, some of the features such as um, describing the research or um, announcing the research was done, but they were unable to use some others such as using visuals or using hyperlinks. Um, the second was that we need to teach academic writing skills. And this might sound a little bit counterintuitive, but um, we noticed that some students were unable to actually um, use the academic text because they, uh, so for example, they would use the entire academic text as a source of results instead of just a results section. The third is that we need to pay attention to the shift between the academic and the popularized writing. Right now they would be either really academic or very popularized and was nothing in between. The fourth is that we need to make students aware of the fact that they can step forward as a writer. So for example, they can use examples from their own daily lives. Um, and the fifth is that we need to actually teach strategies uh, for style and narrative because they're very important for um, reformulating academic discourse and they were really hardly used at all um, by the students. So yeah, that's it, thank you. Thank you so much. I think we should keep those um, five strategies in mind and maybe we can come back to them later. Uh, please, all attendees and, and other panelists, if you have something you want to ask, please put it in the Q&A section. And um, we have one more presentation to go. And it's from uh, Dana Tupusis, at, uh, if I'm correct, at the University uh, of California. And uh, your presentation is called Science Communication Training and Insights. Please, I think you'd better explain and present it yourself. So Dana, please, uh, the screen is yours and here we go. Great, thank you. So here at UC Davis, I've incorporated science communication training into the work of the Office of Strategic Communications, which I lead. I want to tell you very broadly about how this work has evolved and grown over the five years or so and how it's grown into a partnership with faculty. Many university central communications offices offer media training, practice and tips on how to do media interviews. We do that too, but it's much broader. In our four hour workshop, we work with faculty, graduate students and postdocs in small group settings. We charge a relatively small fee for the workshop. We focus on talking about audiences, what is good communication, how to craft, and how to deliver your message. We give the group opportunities to practice with peers and experts. We've had hundreds of faculty go through the training and they all rate us highly in what they've learned and take follow-up training with us that is more hands-on in the areas of social media, on-camera training, public presentations, and crisis communications. We feature many of the faculty on our live uh, science shows and podcasts. In 2019, a small group in our department approached women faculty leaders and asked them to help us organize a full day workshop for younger women faculty who may not feel empowered to speak publicly about their work. The faculty readily agreed and what you're seeing is the agenda for a full day workshop of discussions that was held in December, 2019. We brought together women faculty, journalists, science communicators and others to develop a network of support we had about 50 women from all walks of life participate and all were actively engaged and very open about their experiences in the world communicating, particularly in online settings, but in other settings as well. We'd planned to hold another in 2020, but the, pand the pandemic delayed things and we'll probably recommit to this in 2022. In 2019, the Dean of our College of Biological Sciences and a faculty member there, we work with quite closely, approached me about helping with some funding for a science communications program they were starting with UC San Diego as a pilot program. Our contribution funds postdoc participation and other workshop costs. 
The mission of these workshops, as you can see, is to train academics to improve communication to a broad audience, but it goes a step further and seeks to develop culturally relevant science communicators at UC Davis and beyond. The main focus of these sessions is around the question of how often do you apply or plan to apply cultural awareness to your science communication efforts? Participants in these sessions express afterward how their mindset has changed to be more inclusive and to think about their audiences from a cultural standpoint so that engagement with them is reciprocal and reflexive. It's gone from an expectation about learning best practices to really considering audiences experiences and knowledge in an intentional way. So far, more than 100 people have attended one of four workshops and 110 people are registered for a session later this month. I hope you'll look at ways you can partner with your communication offices if you have one. There's a rich level of experience and ideas there beyond just media training. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much for a very nice um, um, presentation. And I think it was very good final presentation to this talking about the cultural uh, context of science communication as well now then everyone it's q a time but before that i will ask the attendees to uh to um, think about their experience of this uh, session because there will be a poll about the best presentation and i'll i'll launch that now and keep it open for a few minutes so that uh, yeah the attendees can can choose and i won't the thing is i can't tell you afterwards who who won it but that will be obvious uh, later on or will be published later now we have some questions in the q a here and why don't i just take them from um, from the top uh, there's one for miguel to start with uh, and that's the 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 pub thing isn't it uh, what type of training is given to the students before they present their work in public? Yeah, we don't we don't give any kind of training. We send normally some guidelines, and we have a, a brief uh, introduction before the the sessions. But a formal training uh, we don't we don't give to them. But normally there are. Um, their uh, the researchers are uh, comfortable and uh, associated with other psychom activities the most of the of the researchers that participate and one of our goals is to reach to the other ones the ones that are not so comfortable and not at ease and this kind of of sessions and initiatives yeah but it's an idea to explore indeed <laughs> indeed anyone else who wants to comment on that from the panelists, just have to say, here I am, I have May this I? idea. Sorry? May I, May I yes. just comment? Actually, yes. and to announce I'm part of also the team <laughs> of Miguel in his activity. Yeah. Surprise. Uh, so, <laughs> so, but yes, that is something that we discuss. How can we empower also the ones that are sharing uh, with us and being part of this activity? And nowadays we are trying to uh, make something around the, the, the country in order to collaborate between different activities. And maybe we can perform something together to, to give some extra um, uh, learning and training to, to our participants in order to not only have this activity, but go further and prepare them to future activities. Thank you. Um... Let's see now. I think I go uh, jump a little bit in this list. Uh, there's also a, a thanks to Florentine for your presentation. Uh, this training program sounds excellent. An anonymous attendee writes. My question is, how do you evaluate the improvement of the program participants? I guess that's an essential question in this case. Uh, yeah, it's a like very essential question. Yeah. Um, so the results that I shared were from first year students. I'm now working on a, a second step where I'm asking those students um, who are now at the end of their third year of training um, to once again write a newspaper article to actually see how they have improved um, their writing. The program right now doesn't contain any training in science communication yet. So I'm, I'm uh, now figuring out how they improve their writing skills if they actually don't receive any training. Um, so I'm still in the middle of that, so I can't I can't share the results yet. So um, it's a very good question. And um, 
I, I can answer it in a couple of, in, in a year maybe, yeah. Thank you. Uh, there, there is a question for all of you. And while you think about that, this is the question. Um, uh, well, I would like to know what the biggest barrier you have found to put your projects into practice. And that's also an important question. But you can think about that while I ask um, uh, Anna again. Um, I'd like to ask, do you think the media like movies or TV series plays a big part in the stereotyping? or what would be the principal causes? Yes, the, the answer is yes, because we found in the drawings, invisible covers, we found robots, we found potions and explosions. That is something that you don't have, you're not used to have in the lab. So yes, for sure, the animations and all the, the, the different um, scenes that they saw in the television have a huge a huge influence in what they drawing because they they have like a 10 week course and we saw huge improvements for example in the way in the number of microscopes in the number of different materials that they have and they use on the lab in their own uh, drawings but uh, for sure uh, not only the things that they do on the school but also out of the school and the television and films are for sure uh, um, impact in the in what they're drawing. Yeah. Thank you. And now for all of you, have you thought about this issue about um, if you have experienced or, or encountered the biggest barrier you have found to, to uh, realize your projects? Anyone who wants to start, Sylvia? Sorry, which one? Because I, I can not... Uh -huh. Sorry, um, the biggest barrier you have found to, to put your project into practice? Uh, the, biggest, the biggest barrier. Okay, I think that it's not science because we come from chemistry, so uh, it's very easy just to bring science chemistry to, to, to society because it's uh, some explosions and, and all these kind of things. Uh, but the, the 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 biggest science is uh, the biggest barrier maybe it's just to realize that these explosions are science for example we were performing a many workshops to to high school just to to let the to let the students know about chemistry and there were many explosions and all these kinds of these very nice things with many colors. And when they start that first course in chemistry, uh, I'm teaching quantum chemistry. So first thing I do is just to write down an integral at the blackboard. So they told me, which is, where, where is the chemistry? Why do we need to do math and all these kinds of things? So, Sometimes one of the barriers is just not to only uh, uh, show these very nice things, but to explain why they so, so, so they have this creative uh, mind, this creative knowledge of everything. Thank you so much. I'm going to say now to the attendees that I will close the um, poll. Uh, there are still some who haven't voted, but I guess you don't want to, or you think everyone is just as good. And I also have a uh, hand up from Laethiu to, I guess, answer the question about, or add your comment to the question about barriers. Yes, thank you. Well, in fact, in our case, when we apply this kind of disciplines in high schools, we don't have the major problems just uh, invite, in inviting people to participate. The physics teacher, Tiago Pereira, he's doing that, you know, the last five years, uh, offering this kind of disciplines to the students. And they came on their own. They are not, they are not forced to, to get into the discipline. And since, since all, all disciplines that he, he, he taught, you know, there were, there were quite a, a lot of students. So, I mean, the major idea is how to move teachers from different areas to offer this kind of disciplines in high schools. Because as, as I said, the engagement of the students are really high, depends on the way that you organize your discipline in a practical way, it's not only theoretical, but put them to build up the experiments and simulators. I think that's the whole idea. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see now. 
Does anyone else who want to comment on that while I take a look at the, the chat as well to make sure that we don't miss any uh, important questions? Luis, is there any magic about, um, about uh, sort of breaching the barriers? Well, uh, we were talking about math, so uh, there's an automatic uh, barrier there, I mean, social. So, uh, well, we try to break that barrier through these uh, tools, right? And I mean, uh, I'm sure <laughs> there are several of the, uh, several people in the audience that is uh, from my team, from Metamorphosis, or the team I, I belong. And they, uh, I'm sure they, they will say that all the um, tools, all the material we try to create is to break those barriers. Even though it's social, it's weird, it's, I mean, uh, maybe the parent, maybe the mother don't want you to uh, show this, this uh, math material. Yeah, I, I just want to add that we are using cards just to explain the difference between quantum and classical chemistry. And this, it's, it's well, I think it's very, very nice because this, the, 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 the highest of the barriers just decrease a lot when you are taking your cards and try to explain something with this. So I like very much your, 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 your trick, but we are using that. We are also using for choir for, for explaining this quantum concept with very abstract quantum concepts. Sure I think you should talk afterwards and make some presentation for the next PCST conference. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> live one, then live one before before an audience. There is one more question, and, and we have like two minutes to go. So why why don't we do this? It's to Miguel and Florentine again. What are the main topics or areas you think you should include in training people? generally speaking, because sometimes training deals with recommendations. And for me, that is not a training at all. What you should, what should you emphasize when training in psychom practices from Paloma Subieta? And um, well, Miguel or Florentine, would you like to have a go? Yeah, um, I think um public speaking it's it's important science writing there's a lot of of areas that converge in this kind of of initiative like uh, like pub hd and and the uh, psychom uh, psychom courses has a, a lot of these of these topics uh, so i think there's a lot of things to to cover in here but uh, science writing speaking in public uh, and uh, we want to, to them to be to be concise and to be effective so it's necessary to have to have trained in that in that point to to effectively pass the the message and try to be also original in the way that they tell their story because the the, the project their lives it's a story so it's it's kind to to look to to this new kind of of ways mm. to tell our our science story. I think it's important. Right. Would you like to add something, Florentine? Yeah, I I agree with Miguel. Um, I think I would add that um, it's very important to consider your target target audience. So who who is it that you're communicating to, and really thinking about that, um, trying to adapt your communication to uh, to whoever that may be. Um, and also, I think. The, the role of narrative is very important too. And I think that's something that we've seen actually in quite a lot of the presentations today, that that's something that keeps reappearing. Thank you. Anyone else who wants to comment on this, like, like uh, Noni or Nemesio or Dana, anyone? Um, very quickly, I think the other thing um, is uh, listening skills, because as you're communicating, um, it's very important to also listen to what the audience um, uh, is picking up from your uh, so so when we do training for comms psychom we we um, emphasize on um, listening skills as well and being able to pick out um, what people are saying. Thank you. Good point. Uh, someone else. Can I just add something about how important it is to make these activities in a way of interdisciplinary areas? I think it's really important to put people from different areas together and put them thinking together because projects or even activities in science communication with people from different areas are much more richer. And I think that's something that we need to promote more and more. 
Thank you so much. Couldn't agree more. And I see a lot of nodding <laughs> around among the other panelists. So with that uh, very good note, I think we could end this. Uh, there is another session, the final one tomorrow, at the same time at six o'clock British science time, no, British science time, British summer time, of course, uh, in Aberdeen where we should have been. Uh, but I hope we'll see you sometime during the actual conference later on and at the next conference, which will be uh, physical, I hope, and we can meet for, for real. Uh, with that, I'll um, just say a very, very warm thanks from me. It was a pleasure listening to this, and I think it was a very nice group to listen to, and you've made my uh, day a lot richer, and I hope you share that feeling with me. So uh, with that, thanks a lot and see you soon again, I hope. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, Jan. Thank it was you. a pleasure you. you. Later. All the best for you. Thank you, Jan. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you.